Right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Muneeb. I'm the co-creator of Stacks and CEO of Trust Machines that is building Bitcoin applications. Uh, today, we're going to talk about unlocking a Bitcoin economy and specifically the role that Bitcoin L2s uh, can play in it. But I think before I sort of like start with that, uh, I want to take a step back and talk a little bit about Bitcoin itself. Like, why is it important? Why do we like it? Why is it special? Like, there are so many cryptocurrencies out there, so many other projects out there. Why is, why is, why is Bitcoin special? So I'll, I'll tell you a little story. Uh, I'll tell you a little story about this person, Wences Cesaris. Some of you might know him. Some of you might not. He likes to keep a very, very uh, low profile. So Wences uh, grew up in Argentina. He actually experienced rapid inflation. A couple of times, as he and his family, they experienced rapid inflation a couple of times while growing up. And that's why he was able to recognize Bitcoin very early, something around like 2011 or so. And I was talking to Vences recently, and he says that the world is beginning to understand the importance of Bitcoin. Right now, I think they understand a little bit about the transparent 21 million cap, that the fiat currency effectively has no cap. Governments can print money whenever they want. It's effectively, they can tax you whenever they want. Right? If, you, if you think of this way, if you have $100 and your tax was, let's say, 25, and the government was printing money, and they printed 20% more money, that's effectively a, another 20% tax on top. Right? And the governments can do that at, at any point. The markets are beginning to realize that having a very transparent 21 million set in stone hard cap asset is actually, actually, actually very helpful. They're very useful. I think they're beginning to realize why is Bitcoin valuable because of that predictability and that scarcity that it has. But the market still doesn't realize is the number one thing about Bitcoin is that it is open and neutral. What do we, what, what do we mean by that? So think of it this way, that the Bitcoin network doesn't differentiate or doesn't discriminate against anyone. You could have any passport in the world. You could be from any background. You could be using Bitcoin for whatever reason that you want. The network is not going to discriminate against you. And that's huge. There's actually no network like that. Whenever you walk into a bank, it matters. Like, I, I had a Pakistani passport, and I didn't have access to certain services until I got my US passport. Think of it this way. We're all human, but we get discriminated against depending on, on where we are from, what type of credentials we have. Bitcoin doesn't do that at all. Does not matter who you are. The second thing is, once something happens on Bitcoin, it cannot be reversed. When you look at the power structures around the world, you know, something happens, some people don't like it, they can actually do something about it. They can come in, they can, they can, they can reverse that transaction. They can say, this never happened. We don't want this to happen. Take it back. Let's say you send the donation to the wrong party. Someone will come and close your bank account and say, you can't do that anymore. On Bitcoin, when something happens, it happens. That's it. No matter how big a country is, how powerful it is, if they want to come in and they try to reverse that, they actually physically cannot do it. It's impossible. And I think that, that type of, of power, that type of technology is something that we are only in, in many ways like just scratching the surface of like how powerful it, it can really be. And then sometimes people ask me, like this is, this is another thing that came up with, with Vences, that what about these other cryptocurrencies, right? Like there's so many other cryptocurrencies, like why Bitcoin? Why is Bitcoin the thing that, that, that is most important? And I think there is something to be said about the belief in Bitcoin, the community behind Bitcoin. It is truly grassroots. It, it, it's been there for over a decade now. It is truly grassroots. There is a set of core believers, me included, Vences included, a lot of others included, who will hold Bitcoin all the way down to zero if it ever went down to zero. I'll do it. I'll absolutely do it. All of my Bitcoin, I'm not selling. Let it go down to zero. I'll hold. If anything, I'll use any fiat left in my bank accounts to buy more. That's the level of belief that it's not just me. You know, it's, it's, it's not even a community of tens of thousands at this point. I think it's hundreds of thousands of people who truly believe 
that we will stick by Bitcoin no matter what happens. And I think that matters. I don't think that type of community exists behind any other crypto project other than Bitcoin. And I think that grassroots movement, that, that value prop that these people actually run their own nodes. Like imagine what's happening in the world uh, these days. You can't trust anything. You see anything online, you see a picture, you see some information, you just can't trust it. That's why it's important that you can run your own node. We are heading towards a future where we will not be able to trust any information. We will not be able to trust people. We wouldn't know, are, am I even talking to the right friend or not, right? Like because of where AI is going and whatnot. But being able to run your own Bitcoin node, to verify things yourself, is a huge, huge thing. So if, if there are other, other cryptocurrencies, there are other blockchain networks where you can't even run your own node, most of them are like that these days. They're, they're much more centralized. It's much more uh, uh, compute intensive to try and run your own node. Bitcoin is not like that. From day one, Bitcoin has been about anyone with a normal internet connection, with a normal off-the-shelf hardware, should be able to run their own node. And I think these properties, these properties are extremely, extremely important. And, and, and we all know about Bitcoin being durable and predict predictable. You're going to hear from Jameson Lopp in a while, but he had a great stat that you can actually just download Bitcoin software literally from 10 years ago, from 2013, boot it up, and it will still sync with the current version of the blockchain, and it will work. A software that was like 10 years ago. I, I, I think you cannot say that about any other cryptocurrency. Any, any other software project, for that matter, that's something that is that durable, if, if, if this is what happened in the last 10 years, it'd give us high confidence that decades from now, Bitcoin will still be there, still be durable, still be predictable, something that we can rely on. I think this is what makes Bitcoin special. And this is what makes Bitcoin just stand out from everything else that's going on in the industry. I'm not against the, the other stuff. I think it's great. There are different experiments. People are doing all these things. But let's not confuse those experiments with Bitcoin that is fundamental and that can actually become a global standard. That makes me think about another point. So for Bitcoin, look at the sort of like the perfect storm that is arising in the world. We have rapid inflation. We have a looming debt crisis. And there is increasing mistrust between nations. So let's say Brazil wants to have its own network and its, its, its own currency and wants to trade in something other than the dollars. What thing do you think people would agree on? If there, there are two countries, they're not the US, they want to trade with each other and they want to come to a common standard, they're not going to adapt each other's standards. Every country wants to have their own thing. So people are looking for something that's actually truly neutral. And I think that point is, again, very, very important because when global standards emerge, they emerge around something that is truly neutral, right? That's TCP IP. It's neutral. Anyone can use it. It's universal. It just works everywhere. And I think once standards emerge, it becomes very hard for something else to compete with it. I think gold is a great example. Once gold was gold, it was very hard for something else to come in and, and displace gold. And I think this is where Bitcoin is heading. And, and it's sort of like unfortunate in a way that bad things in the world might happen that might actually benefit Bitcoin. It's not that we are rooting for those bad things to happen, but what we are saying is like, let's be prepared. Let's keep our eyes open. Let's understand all, all the stuff that's broken with the current financial markets. And at least we can be prepared. We can tell our friends to be prepared, our family to be prepared, and go out and try and educate as many people as we can so that they can be prepared for a world where, where the, the traditional markets start to crash, and Bitcoin is the thing that is a flight to safety. And I think with the Bitcoin next cycle, it's, it's almost like I've, I've seen this story for 10 years now, right? Like every cycle, I look at it, I look at Bitcoin as a, uh, the price of Bitcoin almost is a technology adoption curve. Right, the first cycle went from, you know, depending on how you count it, from, from a few thousand users to maybe a couple of million users. Then we hit 10 million users. In the last cycle, maybe we hit 100 million users on the high mark. Again, depends on how you count it. Are they active or not? Or somebody who's just made an account once? And I think next cycle is the one 
where it, I'm pretty confident that this time we'll cross 100 million users and maybe run towards a billion users. That's huge. That's the time when uh, technology goes from just being in the hands of early adopters to much more mainstream. So I think next cycle, and halving is not that far away, I think April of next year is something to really look forward to because that's, that's the time when you're taking the leap. So, so far, I've tried convincing you that Bitcoin, the technology, is special. It is something that is truly revolutionary, and it can change the world. So now when we look at Bitcoin itself, what is needed to unlock that level of growth? Is Bitcoin, the technology, ready to do that? And I think that's, that's the place where, where, where Bitcoin L2s come in. So this is a great visual. Uh, to think about, like if you think of like a glacier, part of it is actually visible above, above the water, right? And that's, that's the thing, that's Bitcoin, the asset that you see right now, right? Almost like $500 billion uh, of value. And I think when you think about creating a Bitcoin economy, that's the thing that we are not seeing right now. That's the big part of the glacier yeah, underwater where if we unlock BTC, truly unlock it as internet money, and people are able to use it, people are able to freely trade it in decentralized exchanges, people are able to deploy it in liquidity protocols, in lending protocols, and use it as internet money all the time, then you're creating a native Bitcoin economy. And we, and we have seen this happen with other assets like Ethereum. And it creates a great flywheel that the more people that use it, the more developers that can use it, it actually makes that economy much more valuable. And Bitcoin is so valuable just as a store of value right now. And if we can unlock this, if we can unlock a truly native economy for Bitcoin, I think, I think, I think that, that would be huge. We all know that how ordinals sort of like uh, revived Bitcoin builders culture. I think I, I won't go into too, too much details, but it, it was an amazing thing to see where Arnold's came out of nowhere and really, really changed the culture and developers started coming in and, and, and started saying that uh, Bitcoin is a place where we can build, Bitcoin is a place where we can do interesting stuff. So if there's one thing I want you to take away from this talk, that is that Bitcoin L2s are the single most important thing that we need to work on to grow Bitcoin. What's the reason? I think a lot of people make this mistake, and we should like, mentally separate Bitcoin, the asset, from the rails that it runs on. Right? So there's BTC, it runs on the L1, and there are certain properties of the L1 that we want that would make BTC very valuable. That's good. Right? So whenever someone says, hey, don't change Bitcoin, what they're saying is, don't change the L1. That's fine, but we can have different rails. There can actually be hundreds of L2s if you, if you want, and those L2s could be as experimental as you want, because it doesn't matter, because you're, you're moving your Bitcoin. It's like moving your Bitcoin from cold storage to a, hot, to a hot wallet. You'll keep most of your holdings in cold storage anyway, and if you want to play around with certain amounts of uh, Bitcoin, you can move it to an L2, and these L2s could be cheaper, they could be faster, uh, they could be more experimental, there could be smart contracts running on these things, and I think this is a key thing that has been missing in Bitcoin so far. So, so then, with the lack of L2s, what happens is people start alternate networks. When you see a Solana, it's great that there are so many developers building in Solana and they're experimenting with all these new DeFi primitives, but they also create a different asset than Bitcoin and that just separates out the community, right? It's almost like you're, you're starting a separate country. You're no longer flying the flag of Bitcoin. You're no longer using BTC, the asset, and you created something else. And I think you can resolve that by having a lot of really good, high-quality Bitcoin L2s, because these L2s can have BTC as the asset. And this is the thing that Stacks is doing now. Like with the Nakamoto, upcoming Nakamoto release, it's completely focused on the movement of BDC from L1 to L2. Can we have a decentralized network that in a secure way can easily move Bitcoin from the L1 to the L2, and then you can just use BDC 
on the L2 how you want to. And, and obviously, we are, we are trying to work on making it faster so that UX could be something that is compatible, comparable to what people are used to on networks like Ethereum, Solana, and so on. So personally, I'm super excited about the, the Nakamoto release. I think it's finally getting all of the check marks that we need to unlock Bitcoin DeFi. And the way I think about this is that Ordinals really showed people that NFTs are possible on Bitcoin. And I think what SBDC can do with the Nakamoto release is really solidify that Bitcoin DeFi is possible, it's here today, and, 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 and we can actually work with it. Let me, let me, let me pause there. I think the, the takeaways from this talk should be Bitcoin is special. We, should be, we are lucky to witness the growth of a technology like Bitcoin. And the next step, the most important thing for the growth of Bitcoin, for truly taking it to a billion people, is to have extremely high quality Bitcoin L2s. Stacks Nakamoto is playing its role, but there are a lot of other projects who are, who are moving in the same direction as well. Thank you so much.